This episode of Epicenter Bitcoin is brought to you by Ledger, now accepting pre-orders for the all-new Ledger Blue Developer Edition, a Bluetooth and NFC touchscreen hardware signing device. Learn more about the Ledger Blue at ledgerwallet.com and use the discount code EPICENTER to get 10% off your first order. Hello and welcome to Epicenter Bitcoin, the show which talks about technologies, projects and startups driving decentralization and the global cryptocurrency revolution. My name is Brian Fabian Crane. And I'm Meher Roy. Today we are joined by a very interesting guest. His name is Andrew Miller and I've been following Andrew Miller's work for the past few years. He, some of you might, some of our listeners might know him as uh, Socrates1024 in Bitcoin Talk. He has made such great postings on that forum that uh, it's very interesting. Um, uh, he is currently a PhD student at the University of Maryland and he focuses on, uh, mostly his work focuses mostly on cryptocurrencies. Over the past few years, he has done various interesting research projects such as replacements of proof of work to discourage mining pools, um, new ways of exchanging currencies like decentralized exchanges, ways of making order books, ways of enhancing privacy, etc. So he's a very interesting guest we have today. But before we start, perhaps we should take some take out for some time for Andrew to introduce himself. Andrew, can you give your introduction? Uh, sure. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, yeah, I'm Andrew. Like you said, I'm a PhD student at the University of Maryland. Uh, I really like doing cryptocurrency research. Uh, I, I especially work on programming languages and cryptography, but I'm interested in kind of all facets of cryptocurrencies. So how long has it been that you've been interested in this area? Um, I think it would be about uh, three to four years now. Um, I remember when I was just uh, getting started on this, I would post on, on Bitcoin Talk as a way of kind of trying to see if there were viable research topics. Uh, and I, I started doing this full time and transferred to the University of Maryland just to work on cryptocurrency research in the beginning of 2013. How, how was that received at the time? Was that looked at as something uh, bizarre? And did you get resistance from your advisors? Yeah, yeah, it was a very weird process. Um, I mean, I was in computer graphics at the time at the University of Central Florida, and my advisor then very uh, patiently, you know, allowed me to go off on this tangent, you know, kind of dropping all of the other stuff that I was doing in computer graphics and pursuing what would have seemed to be a completely ridiculous uh, uh, tangent to go off on on this cryptocurrency stuff. Right at the time, it wasn't nearly as big of a deal you know, as it is now. So it didn't, you know, I, I, I fully imagine that when I got it started doing Bitcoin research, that Bitcoin was going to crash and I'd be there trying to tell people, no, hey, this is actually a really great idea. There's like theoretically interesting things. You know, it's still a good topic, even though everyone's forgotten about it. Uh, but then that turned out not to be the case at all. And now it's a, a, you know, a household name. So it's a lot easier to talk about. But at the time, it seemed like a really big risk to take. Yeah, but also a risk that probably paid off now because now also on the academic side, there's so much interest and, and I, I don't see that going away anytime soon. And of course, if you know, if you're sort of among the first who have really seriously pursued that, that is a great position to be in. Yeah, absolutely. I got in the ground floor of, uh, of cryptocurrency research and that's been a lot of fun. So we ha we had some difficulties like choosing what topic we're going to talk about because Maher, as he mentioned, he's been following you for a long time, and so he put it up this big list, like super well researched, of like all <laughs> these things we're going to have to talk about. And I looked at it, was like, oh, my, this is going to be either it's going to be a, a three hour episode, or we're going to have a very cursory, superficial treatment of most of these topics, and so we have to hurry through it. So we, what we've said is like, well, let's let's sort of push off a, a big chunk of it, and and perhaps we'll we'll do another episode to talk on on those projects and let's focus uh, purely on on ethereum and you've done some work on ethereum you've uh, you've done a security audit on ethereum and in, in particular there there's some a, a lot of interesting intricacies because i think ethereum has a lot has gotten a lot of attention but it's it's hard to understand you no know, it's it's hard enough to understand bitcoin and it's not exactly easier to understand ethereum and i think some of the work you've done it should provide us a good window to kind of dive dive deep into that. So I, I, I look forward to that a lot. Yeah, let's go for it. Let's go for it, yeah. So, so, so tell us, what was the security audit the first the first time you, you kind of got involved in Ethereum or, or have there other things been before that? 
Uh, so I had looked into some issues with Ethereum and smart contracts. I made a forum post on on the Bitcoin forum pointing, uh, not the Bitcoin forum, one of the Ethereum forums, which I'm not even sure exactly which Ethereum forum, and pointed out a couple of things that interested me that seemed to be hazards that no one was talking about, about things that can go wrong when you're trying to compose complicated uh, smart contracts. I think the one that I wrote about was, was some you know weird condition that can happen when a contract um, sort of calls itself like a recursive function that calls itself and you can get these kind of interleaved states that are a little bit unexpected. Um, so I think it was really on the basis on that that they uh, uh, you know, asked me to help with the, the security audit. Um, so you know, that came after uh, these things that I had just done on my own. And, and so the audit then was performed, that was before the, the launch of the, the actual, the beta launch and at some point, you know, after the crowd sale as a sort of, you know, in the, in the final stage before Frontier went live. Was that when it happened? Yeah, yeah, it was, it was several months before the launch of Frontier. And, and this was something that was done joint with Least Authority, uh, you know, who make Tahoe Laughs, the distributed file storage project, and who are now involved in uh, the, the zero cache launch. So did your audit of Ethereum focus on certain aspects of the system or was it like a general code audit starting from design and ending a at Absolutely. Code well? I, I, it was very targeted. I wouldn't even call it a security audit. It, it was more of a spot check and we had a very specific scope that we were going to look at. Ethereum also had a full-scale general security audit uh, and, and hired a bunch more people to do the, the general view. Um, we really focused on two specific things, which were issues related to the gas mechanism and incentives and also on their proof of work puzzle. And those were the only things that we were looking at and, and we would call it an analysis rather than a security audit because we didn't try to go you know, exhaustively and catch everything. Uh, and for that matter also, our, our main point of entry was the yellow paper itself, the on paper reference rather than the particular code implementation. So we tried to look at design issues. Okay, so for our listeners uh, who haven't actually gone through Ethereum, uh, Everyone knows Vitalik's white paper that laid out kind of the vision for Ethereum, but Gavin Wood came out with the Ethereum yellow paper that describes the Ethereum system in mathematical notation. It's quite a complicated paper. It's a long, complicated paper, but it really uh, is the heart of the Ethereum system because unlike Bitcoin, Ethereum has many different implementations like there's uh, Ethereum in the Go language, there's Ethereum in C++. And all of these implementations are supposed to tail the Ethereum yellow paper. So you can think of it as the main specification document for Ethereum on which the clients are made, right? That would be right, Andrew? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Bitcoin's reference is the Bitcoin core C code, right? And uh, uh, Ethereum's reference is the yellow paper. So basically you, you performed uh, an audit of the yellow paper, like not an audit, but uh, an analysis of the yellow paper about what what it does well, what kind of attacks are possible in that system, and how does the proof of work function perform, etc. Yeah. Okay. In in general, how was your experience uh, interacting with the Ethereum dev team? Do you do you think they were responsive to criticisms or suggestions you came up with? Yeah, I, I really enjoyed it. I thought that they were very responsive. They were very helpful in uh, uh, answering answering any questions that we asked really quickly. Uh, even just as, as you're bringing this up, it's reminding me, I really liked the getting to get some visibility into their development process. I thought it was really interesting and I think a pretty good idea, uh, you know, if you can afford it to develop several different competing implementations that are all expected to be in sync. So, you know, if there was ever a implementation bug where the C++ version and the Go version diverged, then, you know, all of the developers would sit together and, you know, and look at the yellow paper too, and they would figure out, is this an error that's also in the yellow paper or do two of the specifications match the yellow paper? And, uh, you know, doing it that way, because the code bases are so different and they're all done entirely from scratch, you know, implementation bugs tend to occur one, but not exactly the same way in the other. So that is a good way to catch them. And in that context, the yellow paper is just another one of the reference implementations that's supposed to be in sync with all the others. Right. And, and then, so you mentioned gas and I think, I think that's, that's an interesting, interesting way to sort of dive into that because in, Ethereum, right? Uh, computations are paid with gas, right? So the, the whole idea of Ethereum basically is that you, you know you send transactions and contracts and all that to this chain, and they get executed, and and you know they're paid by gas, and so you pay for each computational step by gas. At the same time, the currency 
of Ethereum, right, is Ether. So that's, I think that on its own is sort of confusing because it's like, how do those two relate? So can you explain a little bit, why was it even necessary to have gas? Why can you just pay everything with Ether? I see. So you're asking especially why does there have to be any sort of conversion between uh, gas and Ether? Uh, right. So the way that that works in a transaction is that you know, when you make a transaction, you say this is how many, this is how much gas that I want to pay, and this is the conversion rate that I'm willing to pay for ether to gas. Uh, so the rationale for that is the way that the gas mechanism is implemented is that each opcode in the Ethereum virtual machine has a sort of fixed rate of how many gas tokens it costs. And so, I mean, the reason that there's this conversion rate is because you don't want to have to change the fee schedule in gas units per opcode every time the price of Ether changes. So the reason to have those two is just so you can decouple the market price of Ether from the sort of relative costs of different opcodes. Okay, so, so you sort of have, you know, let's say sending a transaction costs 50 gas, like each step costs 10 gas, you know, you have all, all these different things and then but the real cost is going to vary right because the real cost is going to depend on well how much ether do you have to pay per gas and then that is again a sort of a market mechanism but from a programming perspective i guess the advantage it would be that you can you can hard code you know this is cost this many gas without having you know to change that as as the cost of ether changes so the demand changes yes yeah, exactly. And in the program code, you know, it's common to, there are instructions that let you see how much gas is remaining. When you call another contract, you can kind of carve off a portion of your gas remaining. And so the units that you use for that kind of programming is always in gas. And so it stays kind of static. So what was your overall impression of the gas model? Does it make sense to you? Did you think that's the, they went about it the right way? I think it makes sense. I'm, I'm impressed with it. I think it's quite novel. I haven't seen any... Uh, other programming language that really features uh, anything like that. So I think it's a really clever uh, and, and good idea. I think it's pretty effective. So, um, so like, like Ethereum device gas because, uh, because fundamentally in any program, it is not possible to know whether it's going to terminate or not. So if you don't have something like gas, then you could have a smart contract that has an infinite loop and keeps going forever. And then you need some way by which you know how to exclude these infinite loops out of the picture. So do you think the Ethereum gas model will be effective at, at this aim of preventing infinite loops? Uh, it, it's absolutely effective at preventing infinite loops. That's, that's a problem that the, you know, this, this adequately solves. Um, I mean, that's not the only way to go about preventing infinite loops. Um, uh, one thing I'll have, be happy to dig into is that I think that the, the Turing completeness uh, goal is a bit overstated or, or uh, misinterpreted. Uh, so while it's true that for an arbitrary you know, program that you have, you can't check whether or not it has infinite loops or not, uh, it, it is possible for most programs that you want to provide a program along with a proof that it does terminate. So for most programs of interest, the programmer can provide uh, some kind of proof in a uh, uh, a program analysis format that you know guarantees that it doesn't terminate or that that it doesn't have infinite loops. So uh, and you can have languages that are very expressive and that aren't fully Turing complete and that don't support these infinite loops but are still expressive enough to carry out a bunch of tasks. On the other hand, gas would still be useful because just because a program doesn't have an infinite loop doesn't mean that it won't run for a very long time. And so it's useful to have a mechanism to exclude uh, contracts that run for too long. Um, even if they would terminate eventually, if they run for too long, you might want to charge them more than other contracts, right? And so in Bitcoin, basically the only mechanism we have in this priority calculation is that transactions that are larger uh, cost more you need to get the same priority. And so for exactly. contracts, it makes yeah. sense to have a way of charging contracts more or charging transactions more that cause more execution to occur. And so you know, that's, a good, uh, that's a good mechanism to do that. So it's a little bit separate from infinite loops. That's not the only reason to have that. Right, because it's it's like a public good in a way, you know that that Ethereum chain, and and you want to have people pay for it, just just in the same way that basically with Bitcoin they pay to be included in the blockchain, right? And mm -hmm. and and uh, you know as you mentioned, right? If of course if the the fee varies with the transaction size, and that that exactly sort of reflects how much space you take up there. So I think from that perspective, it's it's absolutely essential, you know, beyond the infinite loop to to have 
a model like that. But so one one thing I find interesting about this. So when you say you hard code how much gas you pay for for different operations, can you give examples of of some of those things and if you have to hard code that, does that mean like in reality they the the cost of executing those corresponds to to the ratios you pay in gas? So let's say something costs 10 gas and something else costs 100 gas, does that mean for the miner or for the network, the, the real cost of the thing that costs 100 gas is, is actually 10 times higher than the thing that costs 10 gas? Uh, it should. I mean, that, that is the, I mean, that there's kind of some approximation involved there. But when they were setting the prices, uh, as I understand it, they actually did a lot of uh, kind of benchmarks on various machines to get an estimate of what is the real cost or the real execution time for these different opcodes. So, yeah, that's roughly the intent is that the, if you look at the, the, gas price of executing a, uh, a contract with some message that should roughly correspond to the actual computational resource involved in running it. So it's not perfect, of course, because different machines do different things faster. And uh, so it doesn't necessarily capture all of the things that are involved, but that's roughly the, the intent. But so let, let's say now there are some errors here, or, and, and let's say maybe over time, you know, hardware changes, miners change, you know, the world evolves. And let's say those errors or little inaccuracies get bigger. Could that cause serious problems? I don't know whether or not they would be serious, but an example of the kind of problem that it could cause is you could have people designing contracts that actually cost a lot more and are a much larger burden to the network. Uh, because they're very expensive, but if they're underpriced, then that may be the cheapest way to get some task done. So, for example, you know that you could have some hash function that's actually really, really expensive. Say it's like SHA-4 or something. Okay, and just suppose it's really expensive, but that it, it, I mean it's actually really computationally expensive, but it's very underpriced. It costs only one gas unit. Then you might see people trying to use that function more and more because it's cheaper in terms of what you have to pay, but it's actually worse for the network to have to process all of that. So, I mean, that that's the, that's the concern with having uh, the prices be mismatched to the actual computational cost. So, in, in, in essence, this kind of thing creates like an attack vector where a programmer could create a smart contract that needs a lot of, say, if SHA-4 operations are cheap, then he could create a contract that needs that needs that executes a lot of uh, these operations and he pays a very small fee amount for it and the actual cost to the network to the nodes of the network to execute this operation store or uh, the results of this operation are much higher than what they are deriving as revenue from this operation itself right yeah yeah exactly right and for anyone who's listening to this, like five years from now, I have no idea at the time what a, what SHA-4 actually is. So no offense to your hash function. That was just a made up example. So, so is there a way to change it over time? If if it turns out that maybe some errors were made and actually, you know, there are these mispricings and they get, they lead to all kinds of weird things happening. Can, can you go, go back and say, okay, we need to adjust that? Yeah, uh, I don't. I mean, there's no obstacle to effectively hard forking to change the fee schedule for the various opcodes. And one of the things that seems to distinguish Ethereum from Bitcoin is that they are, uh, you know, they've made it clear that they're willing to do hard forks as necessary for, uh, you know, improving it. So while that's a huge issue for Bitcoin uh, these days, that seems like a, a totally plausible upgrade mechanism for Ethereum. So I think it would just be a matter of changing those. Uh, you know, one right. of the things that can happen. Uh, yeah, so like you said, the you know the, any kind of mis like mispricing results in some kind of denial of service attack vector where you don't pay very much, but you cause some kind of load on the network. And so uh, uh, one of the things that we tried to look at in this analysis was you know to try to see are there any ways that we can cause more harm to the network or more cost to the network without having to pay for it. And some of the things that we found are are along those lines. Um, in general, it would be cool to have some way to automatically update the costs of opcodes. I know that was something that Vitalik talked about, um, but I don't think has, has uh, implemented yet. So conceptually, you could have other upgrade mechanisms. Uh, and, and finally, one of the points that we made, and we could talk about this a little more, but that uh, 
one thing that you can't rule out simply by having these opcodes is the ability to pay miners out of band as a way of sort of uh, circumventing some things. So if you have some opcode that you want to use that's actually uh, priced the wrong way, you might be able to make a deal with the miner out of band where you set the gas price to be wrong so that you kind of scale all of the opcodes down and you pay less in fees. And it may, you may make up the difference to the miner just by paying them out of band. So it's possible that even the, the policies that are there, if they're too far out of whack, then people may find other ways of making side deals to circumvent the you know, intended price. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. Because one of the, you mentioned uh, the, the possibility of some sort of attack vectors, you know, people doing big transactions cheap or something like that. But uh, the thing actually I was thinking about was, was let's say you need to use a specific operation, specific opcode, and that one just happens to be on the price. Then now you don't want to take advantage of it, but you know if you just pay the normal fees, miners might say, "Well, we don't include that." You know, like we just always throw that away. But then, yeah, I guess that would be a way to to circumvent that. Yeah, yeah, miners could say if you use this opcode, then you just need to, you know, add your increase your gas price, like the the rate of ether that you pay for it, so that it sort of averages out to what uh, what they wanted you to pay. Yeah, so then that's the mechanism for you know circumventing the prescribed price. Uh, okay, so I could say I I am using this cheap operation, but I I'm willing to to pay more per gas, and and then different people might pay different rates uh per gas it, within a block right let's take a quick break so i can take you to paris i stopped into the ledger offices and met with eric larchevec ledger ceo and he filled me in on the upcoming ledger blue in early 2016 we are going to release the ledger blue this is a personal privacy device which runs on a secure element has a touch screen NFC, Bluetooth, and USB connectivity, and it will be a full-fledged hardware wallet with a second factor validation of the transaction directly on the screen. It will be fully open source, you will be able to add your own apps, and it will also be compatible with Fido second factor authentication. Password has going, are going to disappear, and it will be replaced by this kind of cryptographically secure authentication. The Ledger Blue will be certified by FIDO and will give you the possibility to log in on any website very easily just by signing a cryptographically secure challenge. Ledger is making hardware wallets easy and convenient without compromising on security. If you want to get a secure setup for storing your Bitcoins, go to ledgerwallet.com and use the code EPICENTER to get 10% off your order. We'd like to thank Ledger for their support of Epicenter Bitcoin. So in, in a sense, this kind of seems like a governance problem almost like like in Bitcoin, we have this problem where you have the block size, which is one MB and people want to increase it, but they can't come to consensus on it. So this 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 mechanism where different opcodes like a SHA-3 operation or a, or, a, or a jump operation or a store operation, all of these have different prices and those prices are set by the Ethereum dev team currently. But don't these seem like avenues for future conflicts like the block size uh, like the block size increase in bitcoin yeah absolutely uh, it, it's absolutely a question of of uh, governance and whether it's easy to upgrade these or not depends on how easy it is for the ethereum dev team or whatever you know political factions uh, you know are able to to push things like that along if it becomes contentious then i could imagine the same you know challenges happening to ethereum that face bitcoin right now um so far, it doesn't seem like the Ethereum dev team has a problem with that, but they're currently, you, you know, uh, uh, largely in control of this and don't have the uh, the dissent that uh, different factions in Bitcoin have currently. Yeah, I mean, I just was I wanted to say it's also it's so early, right? So it, when you now it's, it's also it's early. There's not that much at stake, and you have this sort of homogeneous development community. But you know, Bitcoin is now. Uh, how old is Bitcoin now? It's uh, six, yeah, years six years soon, right? And a lot of things change within the, within that sort of time frame. 
Yeah, yeah. So it's hard, it's hard to speculate, and, and this this is true for the uh, the analyses that we say, and even this just discussion that we had. They're very much about kind of strategic interactions between fees payers and miners, and there's no evidence that the you know miners are like that they have an API where you can request bribes or, or things like that. So these are things that are kind of you know strategically speculative, but aren't necessarily you know attack vectors that are going to be used right now. So uh, with regards to the gas mechanism. Um, you mentioned that there might be there are there are ideas for like automated ways of updating the gas prices could you shed light on what what these could be how how would you solve the governance problem essentially in an automated fashion um, a really coarse example that I mean, it's easy to talk about because Ethereum also features this mechanism to tune other uh, tunables in, in the system is simply to have miners vote on it. So, uh, and this also pertains to something that was in, in our analysis. So right now there's a, you know, Bitcoin has a block size limit and people have talked about having, uh, you know, ways of automatically adjusting it or adjusting it by miner vote. In Ethereum, you don't have a block size limit, but you have a gas limit per block. So you can only spend this many opcodes for all the transactions in a block. And you have to pay gas for size, so this implies that there's also a size bound. So it's a kind of a, there, there is a bound for the combination of the computation and amount of storage used in a block. But this limit uh, is adjustable, it's elastic, and it can change over time. And it can change over time essentially by the median of the, uh, the votes of a miner. So each time a miner mines a block, the amount of gas that they use sort of factors into this uh, you know, function that's a sliding window. So over time, if miners choose to, they can expand this limit. So for a while, even in Frontier, the gas limit was so low that you couldn't make... Um, I think you couldn't make any transactions at all. And so we were actually waiting to see the first transactions and the first contract published on Frontier. You had to wait for the natural process to expand the block size limit up to the point that you could even fit in one transaction at a time. And so that mechanism is a, a that is a mechanism you can use to, to tune things. I don't know whether it's incentive compatible or gameable or totally sound against any attack, but it is a general purpose mechanism. So you could imagine using the same thing to also adjust the opcodes. So in, in Bitcoin, right, one of the concerns a lot of people have with the block size, right, is that so if the block size is too big, it's an advantage for bigger miners, and you start, you know, they start being even more profitable, and and causes all kinds of other problems. Do you see similar problems here, and 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 will, will there be, for example, an incentive for uh, if you're a larger miner to to try to drive up that uh, gas limit? That seems plausible to me. Uh, I don't see any inherent reason why. You know that wouldn't be the case. Presumably, if that's a problem in Bitcoin, the the it's a perfect analog, so it should still be a problem in Ethereum too. But, but do you do you think in in general uh, the, it makes sense to you that the the way the gas limit is adjusted? I mean, I mean, when you when you look at Bitcoin, I right right now there's like no method of upgrading it, so it seems it seems like any any method is better than no method. Uh, and to uh, like updating maybe the, unless it's a bad well, method. Well, no, not any method is better than no method, but a reasonable method is probably better than no method. And this is, sounds like reasonable enough, but I well, have looked deeply into it. If this method works for Ethereum, then I think it would also work for Bitcoin. So I mean, it it, it is a similar, it, it it is a it is a method that's attacking a similar problem in 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 a way that would be applicable. Right, so so this is kind of a way of uh, this is Ethereum testing out a mechanism that if it turns out to be sound, then you know that could also be a solution for Bitcoin to use. Whether it's actually going to be sound, uh, I, I don't know. I mean, so even while I like analyzing the incentives of things and trying to. Uh, look at rationality models and so on. Uh, I know that the kinds of analysis that I do don't reflect all of the intricacies of reality. So when people say, oh, well, there's lots of good reasons why just because this, uh, you know, this seems like it makes sense when you look at it in a simplistic way, it's missing out on the realities of bandwidth in China or something. Yeah, all of that's possible. So I, I would certainly not claim to uh, be able to tell which of these methods is, is going to work, if any. And have have you looked at because in Bitcoin there's a whole range of of attacks that miners could use. I mean we've we've talked on this show we've talked before about selfish mining and about the miners dilemma. Some of the work that Emin Gunsir and Itai Ayal have done, uh, and there's certainly uh, quite a few others. H have you looked at if those translate to Ethereum as well, or are are there some protections against some of these you know known issues with proof of work in Bitcoin? Some of the things are a little bit different. Um, 
I mean, so so Ethereum's proof of work puzzle is designed to be GPU friendly rather than ASIC friendly. Uh, and so one of the things that we looked at in the analysis is to see if that is the, the case. And we concluded that, yeah, it does seem to be the, the case. A lot of this wasn't uh, even so much technical as a matter of looking at uh, hardware catalogs and trying to get a feel for how uh, different memory performance trade-offs are and what their costs are. And so does it seem like it would be possible that someone could uh, make a dedicated ASIC that would be thousands of times more effective than the commodity memory that you could buy? And we concluded, no, the most cost-effective way to solve this puzzle is to use a, a commodity available memory. Um, so even while we concluded that it's effective at being GPU friendly rather than ASIC friendly, I don't know whether being GPU friendly rather than ASIC friendly is the, the right choice uh, for a cryptocurrency. There's these kind of two, you know, uh, opposing points that if you have ASICs, then at least you have this uh, kind of a, a hardware investment that you can't recoup by using it for anything else. Whereas if you use GPUs, then you could sell the GPUs after an attack and they'll still be useful for supercomputing or something like that. So uh, that is to say Ethereum has some distinct differences from Bitcoin in terms of what attacks and incentive landscapes there are. Uh, and even by pointing out the differences, I don't necessarily know which one's better. Uh, similarly, Ethereum has uh, this ghost protocol, and that directly addresses some of the uh, mining concerns, uh, especially in terms of you know increasing the rate of blocks. I don't exactly know what the interaction is with ghost and selfish mining, so I don't know whether whether that actually exacerbates selfish mining attacks or, or gets away with that. Uh, I know that the people who work on those probably have have some thoughts about that, and I just uh, don't remember what their opinions are. So uh, let's 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 drive a bit into the uh, into the proof of work function for Ethereum, like you have brought it up, uh, and we could maybe go into Ghost later. So like as as I understand it, like you could design proof of work functions in in to in at least three ways. Like you could have either have the target of being ASIC friendly, which is Bitcoin short of fifty six. You could have the target of being CPU friendly, which means no matter if you use a GPU or an ASIC. Uh, their performances are going to be pretty similar to what what the what the mining performance for a CPU would be. So this was uh, I think Wordcoin and those guys tried tried this out uh, for CPU friendliness. And the third is GPU friendliness, in which uh, graphics cards are probably the best hardware to to do it. So kind of is there any science to choosing one of these objectives, or is it all pure guesswork today? Yeah, like I don't know. I, I'm, in, I'm inclined to say it's guesswork for 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 choosing among uh, among those objectives. Once you've picked an objective, then there's a lot of science you can do in terms of meeting that objective. Um, I mean, it's not exactly guesswork, but it maybe involves uh, some kind of sense of economics or, or macroeconomics or predictions about hardware trends, which I find hard to do. So, like, what does what does GPU resistance practically mean? Like. Um... Would 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 do you think this means that in the future a lot of people will be able to mine Ethereum, unlike Bitcoin, where uh, miners are getting more and more specialized? Yeah, I mean that that that's uh, that's the rationale for it. Um, one of the things is by being GPU friendly. One of the meanings of GPU friendly is that the the ideal puzzle it should appear that there's very little gain to be had by going through the process of making a specialized ASIC. You could make a specialized ASIC. You could for sure make a specialized board that just has the you know relevant parts of the GPU like the RAM and a simple processor. Um, but you, and you and that'll be more cost effective and more efficient and higher throughput and all. But it won't be that much more. Right, so if you look at like a, a, a GPU versus a SHA-2 Bitcoin mining ASIC, um, it's just like thousands or tens of thousands of times or some you know vast amount more efficient. And so if you can narrow the gap to being only 10 times more efficient, that's still a big factor. But that may be enough of a reduction that it just doesn't seem to make uh, financial sense for someone to spend the tremendous amount of you know engineering design effort to go you know to go through the fabrication process of getting ASICs made. So even just closing that gap may have the economic effect of discouraging people from going through that process of making highly spe specialized ASICs. And then yeah, that that should mean that anyone who can have access to commodity GPU equipment that's roughly as good as what's used for other tasks and. GPU computing and so on uh, will be able to do just about as well. 
so why didn't they try to make a, a proof of work puzzle that is actually suited for for CPUs? Is is that not possible? I don't know how to do it. I, I think that the you know the approach to going about making something GPU friendly is specifically to target its RAM. So it's really about making it like memory friendly. And GPU uh, you know graphics RAM is just extremely efficient and and cost effective right now and very powerful. Uh, if if we knew how to make a CPU specialized puzzle, where you know it would be like proof of x86 or something, like the only way to, to to do well at this puzzle would be strictly to use a particular CPU design. That'd be a really cool achievement. I don't know how to go about doing that. So we, we there's kind of a foot a foothold to designing uh you know memory based puzzles. If we had one for CPU, that would be cool. One thing I've heard people mention was the idea that you have a variety of different proof of work puzzles and you sort of rotate them or you, or you put them on top of each other or something like that. Is that something you've ever looked at? Yeah, like the X11 puzzle design. Um, yeah, I'm not I'm not sure about that. I mean, so it, it, it strikes me as plausible that attackers would still be able to benefit by specializing in whatever is the lowest hanging fruit there. Or you may be able to simply have several different specialized ASICs, each one of which is specialized at accomplishing one of those tasks. And then altogether, it could still be, you know, 10,000s of times better than a CPU. So uh, it could be that there's something along those lines that works, but I'm not totally sure. One of the things that I've thought about is that, you know, one of the things that makes uh, uh, CPUs designed is to be like uh, to use minimal power so it, it's plausible to me that there may be some approach that uh, uh, involves yeah quickly cycling between different things like that so that the only way that you would be able to do it more cost effectively is effectively to uh, power down one circuit when that's not the one that's active um, so I, I, I don't really know uh, it, it does, it's plausible to me that some approach like that could work so uh, I mean, so the one, one other way that Ethereum is trying to disincentivize the building of ASICs for its POW is by saying that, hey, we guys are going to shift to proof of stake. So if you build an ASIC factory, then you might be out left out in the cold. Yeah. And and like our some of our uh, listeners may know that Andrew is uh, that you may have heard of the statement that the problem with proof of stake is that there's nothing at stake. And Andrew is the originator, the creator of that that statement. So, like a Andrew, could you explain? Um, could you talk about proof of stake? Why did you come up with that statement, and what were the conditions then, and what has changed up till now? Yeah. So the problem with proof of stake is that there's nothing at stake. Was a criticism directed at I think Pure Coins uh, puzzle at the time. And I mean, the essence of it is that you can you can do stake grinding for free in, in the sense that you can be applying your stake to many different uh, you know potential views of the blockchain, like many different forks all at the same time. And then you can just continue to work on whichever one seems to benefit you the most. And there's no cost to doing that. So even though the premise of proof of stake is that you should have your, you know, uh, your, your, your coins at risk when you make one of these decisions, that mechanism doesn't actually have any effect when you can simultaneously do this on all of these different forks at the same time. Now this criticism, I've seen it kind of used as a catch-all criticism for all proof of stake puzzles, but what I want to point out is that nearly every proof of stake uh, design since then has had some explicit mechanism to address that concern. So these are the punitive proof of stake uh, algorithms where if you are caught double signing or using the same stake in two different blockchain forks at once, then you forfeit your collateral deposit or your coins get, you know, eaten up or deleted or something like that. So that directly, you know, uh, addresses that concern. There are still other concerns like, uh, you know, Greg Maxwell's view is, is the, the problem of costless simulation, which is another way of saying a, a sort of similar problem, which is that you can always, after the fact, go back in time and uh, pretend to be extending some block a long time in the past. And maybe you've already spent your coins. Maybe this is after the security collateral deposits already been claimed. And so it's hard to retroactively punish someone for something that they do if it affects a fork that's so far back in history that they've already sold the money and moved on. And so, yeah, so is proof of stake. Name for, oh, is that the long range attack? Is that the same thing? 
Uh, I believe long range attack. Uh, maybe I could. I would use the just a matter of semantics. Yeah, th those most commonly are used to refer to the same kind of thing. I mean, conceptually, you could have a long range attack that I'd still want to call a long range attack, even if it wasn't costless. Uh, but but yeah, effectively, those mean the same thing. Okay, because uh, yeah, with long range attack, right? The idea is okay. You can go because if the secure security deposit, you go back far enough so that there is no deposits. You get people's private keys, and then you start doing a chain from there. And if there is some sort of mechanism that affects the the, the rate of blocks, that you know maybe you can be more efficient at creating blocks because you control mm -hmm. the the whole chain, and then you can sort of take over the chain, and you know you can do all kinds of fake things. And then the the way this is addressed, I think mostly is that you do sort of a checkpointing thing, right? That you say, okay, uh, you know, it's final now. And if somebody comes from further back, then, you know, we ignore that. Uh, mm -hmm. So I, I've never been totally confident about how any of the checkpoint mechanisms work. So so certainly that would work, but then the then the burden is on the effectiveness of the checkpoint mechanism. But that's also where my uh, uh, you know in depth knowledge of this kind of uh, uh, reaches a limit. So I, I I don't know whether the checkpoint mechanisms that are proposed work well. I know a lot of people are working on this sort of thing, and so I, I'm I would say I'm guardedly optimistic that there there's some way to do this very well with proof of stake that could work. Actually, I would say I'm, I'm in the middle. It's 50-50. I have no idea whether there's going to be an effective proof of stake. Uh, the, another thing that I like to say on this is that there seems to be, it seems like there's something inherent about burning actual, uh, you know, expending actual power, consuming actual energy. There's something undeniable about that. That's kind of, you know, it involves time. You, you know, unless you have more hardware, you can't burn power any faster. Whereas in any of the proof of stake things, it's only based on subjective view of time, that there's any uh, restriction in time. So I, I like to wonder whether there's some inherent kind of security that you can only get by burning real power. And if not, then that would suggest that there is a way to do it uh, with proof of stake. So I'm undecided, but that's like one of the most tantalizing open problems of this era, in my opinion. Today's magic word is gas, G-A-S. Head over to letstalkbitcoin.com to sign in, enter the magic word, and claim your part of the list of reward. So, um, I mean, I, I guess the, the, the reason like this, this kind of becomes like an, a very interesting problem to think about is once you go into the smart contracts world and you have developers that are writing smart contracts and these applications become more and more complex, all the developers, after a point, all they care about is the gas price. They want it to be as low as it can go so that they can write even more complex stuff. So in a sense, we start to need designs where gas price can be driven very low. And perhaps the thinking behind Ethereum is that with proof of stake, you can make the gas price like 10 times lower than in a proof of work system, right? Oh, I see. You're, you're just saying because um, you don't need to... I mean, it doesn't have to do with the smart contract execution. It's just you, you don't have to subsidize uh, this big expense. I mean, for sure, the proof of work mining is the biggest expense in, in Bitcoin. It's like a million dollars per day um, that's going out to Bitcoin miners, right? That's a million dollars per day that's subsidized by the, you know, inflating the currency by all of the other people that have it. So someone's paying for it. They're paying for it in the decreased value of their, their coins just because of that. So all else equal, you would have far less transaction fees needed if you could do cryptocurrency without the mining. So I, I think it's really unrelated to smart contracts specifically, but for sure, if you could get rid of that mining, it would be a big boon to the economics of the, of the cryptocurrency, as long as you could still have security in the same way. And so overall, your view is on on proof of stake. It's kind of it's interesting, but you're like undecided whether whether it'll actually work and whether it will survive in the long run and and provide the kind of security that's needed once you have real value and really big applications running on these systems. Yeah, I'm. I would say I'm perfectly razor's edge, undecided, fifty fifty. It could go either way, but I'm. It's something I pay close attention to. I'm really eager to know what the answer is. So, uh, so. From your from your whole design audit of Ethe uh, of Ethereum, um, do you think there are some things that are missing from the Ethereum ecosystem that would be nice to add as features? Um, there are a few things. 
let's see here. So one of them is that the Ethereum data structure is designed to support all kinds of SPV-like queries and to even support a zero storage lightweight uh, validation. Like you can be a full validating node yet only effectively look at SPV proofs for each, you know, to validate each new block. But I don't think that any of those are implemented any of the clients. So the data structure is there ready for it, but the you know implementation of these things isn't developed yet. Maybe there is an SPV Ethereum client now. I, I, I may not know if one's come out recently. Um, another point that I want to make is that uh, even though Ethereum is Turing complete, there are some things that you can't do in Ethereum script. Uh, and actually, what, what I'm going to describe uh, was pointed out, although kind of as an aside, in an academic paper by uh, some other people, uh, Kiyas and Hong Sheng Tzu and, and, and others. But uh, the point is that here's an example of something that you can't do with Ethereum, and it doesn't matter how Turing complete it is. Um, something that you can't do in an Ethereum contract is look at the other... Uh, the other transactions that occur in the block that you're currently executing in. And the reason why is that there's no opcode that lets you load in the current uh, block hash. You can't see the other transactions in the, in the block. You can see other transactions in previous blocks, but only because of a hack. Because in Ethereum, you can access the hash of the previous block. And so technically, you could write an Ethereum contract that does SPV validation of the Ethereum blockchain itself. And so by doing that, you could go and kind of check these Merkle tree proofs to see what the state is of the contract at a prior point in time. You can see all of the transactions prior to the, prior to the current block, but you can't tell which transaction order you're in. And you can't see the contents of the other transactions of the block. When would that cause a problem? Um, I don't have any practical explanation why it could cause a problem. I could come up with little contrived examples where it might cause a problem. For example, you might want to have a contract that depends on the storage of some other contract. And in general, there's no opcode in Ethereum that lets you, like you can look at your own storage. Like a contract can look at its own storage and modify it, but you can't access another contract storage unless it provides a get you know, method that you can call. You can't actually go and look at its storage. You can go look at its storage, though, by traversing the storage try, which is committed to in the previous block hash. So you can see the previous blocks. You can see the, the storage of any contract, but you can see the state of what it is in the previous block. So this kind of contrived example I'm coming up with is that you, you might want to depend on the storage at the current moment, but it's possible that a transaction in the current block changed that storage, and you'd have no way to be able to confirm that. Uh, okay, so so what you're essentially saying is like if if there's a contract in which uh, the storage is con continuously being updated, like for example, there's a particular public key stored inside the contract, and it keeps being getting updated, then right now my contract cannot access the public key that was in the other contract hundred days ago. I can only access what is the public key that's in there right now, but I can't access the public key. It, that it's was it's in the there other way around. Days. You can access the one that's historical because you can always traverse backwards as though you were an SPV client from the previous block hash backwards, but you can't see what's changed currently because you can't see the current contract that you can't see the current transactions in the current block. Okay, so I mean, so that's very interesting. So this is just a counterexample to the to the claim that because it's Turing complete, you can do absolutely anything. You no, know, it actually depends on what kinds of information is passed in. You know, it depends on on this execution structure. That on its own is just a counterexample, not a particularly. Uh, so I wouldn't say that this is like a feature that Ethereum needs, but I don't know. Maybe it could turn out that there's something important. Mm -hmm. Okay, I I thought like like reading through your papers, I thought the most important thing that Ethereum lacks is is really transactional pri privacy, like. Like yeah. The example you you gave was that if you have like five people that that want to bid on something, then uh, before the uh, like let's say there's a beautiful Chinese vase that the five of us want to bid on, and we want we want to put our bids in, and uh, and then whoever has the best bid wins. But ideally, we don't want to know each other's bids. Like we don't. I mean, the to design such an auction, we would prefer not to not the participants to know each other's bids before they are revealed. But you can't do something like this with core Ethereum. 
You can, but not in the most direct way. So Ethereum is so tempting because it looks so easy to, to implement all of these things. And if you, you can implement an auction in a dozen lines of code in Ethereum, but it's only uh, but it would suffer from this pitfall. The most direct and uh, obvious way to implement things in Ethereum usually involves leaking a ton of information everywhere. And so an auction is a perfect example. That's the motivating example we use for Hawk. Um, the easy way to implement an Ethereum auction involves everyone just telling you exactly what their bids are, and that's not a sealed bid auction. So that's usually not the economic mechanism you would want. Now, what you can do is use cryptography to build better protocols on top of the smart contract system. Uh, but now you need to actually you know, use the cryptographic primitives that are provided, like you have SHA-3 at your disposal, uh, and there's a hard-coded uh, contract extension that you can use to do uh, elliptic curve uh, you know, signatures to verify elliptic curve signatures. Uh, but for anything else, you would either be forced to you know, not have it or to basically try to implement it in the Ethereum language. And that's really difficult because uh, it's just not a, uh, it's costly to implement uh, cryptographic primitives directly into this virtual machine. You would pay a lot of gas to do it that way. So, I mean, so, so, so like, like we decided, like, so Andrew has this proposal called, um, I don't know if it's a proposal. It's um, Andrew has this paper on on Hawk, which is a system by which you can write privacy preserving smart contracts on Ethereum, right? Mm -hmm. Is that the objective? Yeah. Yep, that's the goal. So of Hawk. I mean, perhaps it's yeah, perhaps perhaps like it's 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 like a deep topic for us to go in in this current show because like we have a one hour slot. <laughs> But we'd like to discuss one of this proposal in another talk of yours because it's a very interesting idea that you can have smart contracts that both preserve the pi privacy and where most of the computation is also off chain. So it, it, it preserves gas as well. It preserves privacy as well. And it's a smart contract like like Ethereum and it's as powerful as the Ethereum contract language, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I mean, and just um, I mean, a, a brief a brief enough thing just to say about is that I'm optimistic that a lot of the things that you would want to do, including more complicated applications that need more complex cryptography, especially for the point of being uh, privacy preserving, I can imagine doing them with fairly minimal additions to Ethereum that come in the form of opcodes that do specific cryptography. So right now you have uh, opcodes built in for hashes and for signatures, but if you also had an opcode built in for uh, various forms of uh, of encryption or for zero knowledge proofs or for other kinds of cryptographic primitives then you know maybe all of these things would be able to be more easily supported yeah so so actually in the future you could have you could have not only currencies like zero cash which are like truly anonymous quote unquote but you could also have smart contracts that are privacy preserving like these this, this these all things are possible in the future and they'll come our way right yeah, I think so. I'm pretty confident in that that these are possible. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's that's very interesting. Like we'll 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 get into this in another episode, but perhaps we should focus on just Ethereum as it is today, in this one. So, um, have have you been looking around the Ethereum ecosystem? What are the kinds of projects that excite you? Oh wow! Um, not as much as I, I should have recently. I watched some of the videos from DevCon, which is amazing because they have. Um, it's like it must be like 40 hours of video footage of presentations all on these different projects. I really like the one on Ethereum World, which is a whole uh, virtual world in the style of Second Life, where you have to buy virtual property, but that's all mediated on the blockchain. Stuff like that's pretty cool to me. Um, I would say that right now BTC Relay is probably my favorite contract. You know, that's one that uh, uh, you know you wanted us to talk about. So happy to to talk about that a bit. That's the first really sophisticated serpent contract that I saw. Um, when I was asking Vitalik for uh, hints on serpent program to sort of make progress with the. Uh, even the Ethereum audit, I wanted to make examples in Serpent. So I'd say, hey, Vitalik, how do I go do this thing? And he'd say, oh, go look at a Joseph Chow's project. That has all the complicated Serpent code in it. And and yeah, so I, I used the BTC Relay's early code as like a textbook for how to do complicated string manipulations and stuff in Serpent. And so it's a really uh, sophisticated coding example. So uh, what does BTC Relay exactly do? Why is it special? So BTC Relay is a Bitcoin SPV client implemented in Ethereum smart contract language. So you can, uh, just like a Bitcoin SPV client receives uh, 
proof of work headers from you know anyone who sends it to them, like other nodes in the Bitcoin network. This is a smart contract that keeps track of the proof of work blockchain of Bitcoin. And so you can advance its view of what it thinks is the longest blockchain fork by uh, submitting proofs of work to it. And then the code of the Ethereum contract checks the proof of work, just like the Bitcoin J SPV client would do on your phone. Uh, and then you can also prove to the SPV client in Ethereum, you can prove to BTC Relay that a transaction's been included or not, because you show it the path through the Merkle tree uh, to the transaction that you care about in the blockchain that the the contract's aware of. So it basically has a whole uh, you know implementation of like a Bitcoin mobile phone uh, blockchain viewer in Ethereum. And I think that that's really cool because, uh, and I can tell you a couple of other examples of you know why I like this. The reason that I like this so much is because this is a, a it's a protocol that spans more than one blockchain. There are only a couple of other examples uh, like this, and I love all of them. So uh, I'm probably also known as a promoter of the Tier Nolan, and I've been told that it, it's Tier Nolan's and also Ido Bentov's uh, cross-chain atomic swap. So this is an old protocol that you could do just with hash lock transactions that lets you trade a Litecoin for a Bitcoin with no risk of one party walking away with both coins. And so that's so clever because it's a thing you can do with, you know, scripting language, but it involves two blockchains, not just one. And, you know, that's awesome. Yeah, I mean, I, I've um, like like this is this is probably the protocol that drew my attention to you the first time because because you wrote the script for it. Like I think Tia Nolan came up with the uh, with the idea and then you wrote the script for it. And uh, it's very interesting uh, that uh, basically for our listeners that haven't heard of TNO Lands protocol, it's it's essentially a decentralized cryptocurrency exchange, which allows you to trade Bitcoin with Litecoin, and there's no counterparty in the middle. It's just you interacting with the two blockchains and conducting an exchange, and you as as a, a party to the exchange can't can't be cheated by the other guy. So that this is really like truly decentralized exchange, and this. This protocol exists and it can actually be implemented in Bitcoin, yep. but for some reason it never was. I I never understood why we don't have we don't have an exchange that works with that protocol. Uh, I've always wondered that myself. It's such a, a, a cute thing. I mean, like anything else, it's probably just a matter of no one's gone out and done it. You know, I should go out and do it if I like it so much, rather than uh, just uh, yammering about it. Um, I mean, it, it requires non-standard transaction types, so that's the kind of catch-all reason you'd have to go get it uh, mined at Luke Jr.'s pool. Uh, yeah, but but it works and it uses script that's available today. I mean, around the same time, uh, uh, Sergio Demian Lerner also made a, a proposal called P2P Trade X, which accomplished the same thing, but in a more in a more interesting way that could also accomplish other things. And this involved having a you know you could use it with Bitcoin and trade to another chain that had to be designed with special opcodes. It's really like a proto version of side chains, actually, because the idea is that the the other chain that you'd be trading with would itself have an SPV client checker. So you would have opcodes in this other language that work like SPV validators of Bitcoin, and that would be another way to achieve this fair exchange. And so that's actually closer to what BTC Relay does. And even sidechains is the other example of uh, you know protocols that span multiple cryptocurrency blockchains. So just the last question before we wrap up with the BTC Relay, which I agree is like super cool, right? Because you know the potential, of course, is that you can use all the smart contracts uh, on Ethereum, you know, with Bitcoin basically. Uh, and, you know, without having, for example, side chains, uh, although that might be interesting as well. But so, so because in Ethereum, like each computational step is, is going to be expensive, is it is building an SPV client and then, you know, checking each time and updating and, you know, submitting proof that, you know, your transaction has gone to that place uh, on the Bitcoin chain, is, is that going to be very expensive? Uh yeah, I, I think it will be very expensive, especially right now, given the current gas prices. Uh, this is one of the reasons why BTC Relay, I mean, I think it runs it runs and it works on the Ethereum testnet, so not even on the Ethereum Frontier network. And the reason why is just that it would be prohibitively expensive right now. Um, I realize that just sending data to transactions is quite expensive in Ethereum right now. I, I worked on this uh, gadget called... Um, like a block hashes gadget, which is a pretty modest little thing that just is, uh, it tries to overcome some limitation of one of the opcodes in Ethereum that only look, lets you look at uh, hashes of blocks in the most recent 256. And if you want to see more block hashes prior to that, a way to do it is to build a contract that stores all the block hashes. So it's almost like a, a, a 
untrusted blockchain mirror for Ethereum blockchain itself. Uh, and I realized that I initially wanted to basically send this uh, every block hash so that it has all of the block hashes in its storage. And I realized that would be too expensive. It would be like $14 a day or something, and I'm not going to pay that. So it, just because of the cost of sending storage to that, I think I ended up doing something like sending to it once every 256 blocks or so, which is still fun, but and it's a lot cheaper, but it doesn't provide the same service. So already the cost of sending things to Ethereum rules out some kinds of applications that I would want. And yeah, and that only gets worse when you try to do more complicated stuff. One nice thing is that BTC Relay, you know, you, you don't have to, you know, if lots of different people use it, they get to sort of amortize the cost of sending proof of work headers to it. So you only need one instance of the BTC Relay contract to provide service for a, a bunch of people who want to see transactions in it. Uh, but yeah, I think the best hope is to, you know, hope that the cost of storage goes down. Yeah, yeah. And of course, there's still the cost of computation and then like verifying proof of works and the headers and, and even that might be expensive now. Yeah, I mean, fortunately, that's pretty cheap. So like the SHA-2 op code is, is pretty cheap in, in Ethereum, which is good. And storage is expensive. And one of the reasons storage is expensive is because every time you do a storage operation, that actually triggers like a whole chain of, uh, of hash computations. So, uh, you know, that, that's one reason that, that a single hash isn't so bad. Okay, excellent. Well, Andrew, we're at the end of our time, but uh, thanks so much for coming on and talking to us today. I mean, I know there was lots of topics we could have talked about, but I thought it was hopefully also gave people an interesting uh, perspective on on gas, which I think is going to, you know, it's, it's obviously a core feature of Ethereum and a core component of how it works. And uh, yeah, thanks so much for sharing your views on that. Yeah, this was a lot of fun. Uh, you'll have to have me on again and we can talk about more things next time. Yeah, absolutely. Certainly. Okay, yeah, well, thanks so much for our listeners. Hopefully you enjoyed this and hopefully you learned a little bit more about Ethereum, how that works and, and how gas works. And uh, very excited to see where that's going to go. And, you know, once we have things like BTC Relay really working and hopefully the cost coming down, that will be very exciting, of course, too, to use Bitcoin on Ethereum. And yeah, so thanks so much for listening. So we are part of the Let's Talk Bitcoin network. So if you want to check out this show or also lots of other shows, you can do so at letstalkbitcoin.com. Of course, you can also download the mobile, uh, the audio versions of this uh, on mobile, on SoundCloud or, you know, whatever podcast app you use. And you can watch video, we do video as well. And that's on youtube.com slash epicenter Bitcoin. And, you know, speaking of Ethereum and speaking of YouTube, Mayhurst, uh, videos from defcon I, i'm not sure if all of them are up but lots of them are up at this stage uh, so if you want to dive into more there there's a lot of content a lot of great content that he has produced there so thanks so much and we look forward to being back next week